this is going to be a very different video from, from what we do usually because I just wanted to talk a bit about our experience uh, when using this as a CPU cooler benchmarking machine and the mistakes we have done in the last weeks that we now learn from and I just wanted to share my thoughts about this and, and maybe some other reviewer will need this information because otherwise he might end up losing a week of work like I did, which uh, isn't really great, but let's see what we did. So we put the whole thing together, everything worked fine, everything was working exactly as expected. And in the past I have used the uh, 3900X as a benchmarking machine, which was a Ryzen 3000, so everything was well known to me back then and I locked the v-core at some random ass point I don't even remember what it was I locked the the core speeds and then I blasted it and I, I took it down to have like 135 watts at the beginning roughly and then from there going up as the CPU gets harder but it was easy and and every CPU cooler that I slapped on top of that it, it had the exact same procedure and everything was standardized normalized I was fine when I put this together, I, or my intention was to have three different workloads. I wanted to have roughly 100, roughly 200, and roughly 300 watts. To have, you know, uh, entry-level CPU, mid-level CPU, and then the, the full blast thing, and then test every cooler to each of these presets. What, what you need to understand is I don't have so much time uh, to prepare this, these videos. So we are releasing three in a week and keeping in mind that I have a second job that I need to attend every day. Uh, so there isn't so much time I can spend with benchmarking. So I, I need to like, um, how, would I sh how should I say, I need to optimize everything. So what I wanted to do is create these presets using Intel extreme tuning program thingy from Intel. Yeah, yeah, this one. And the idea was fine. It, th there is nothing wrong with that. So the problem, however, is, th is that you cannot lock specific things in BIOS and then change them later on in Intel X, C, T, U, whatever, extreme tuning, whatever. Uh, without a reset and I really wanted to avoid having that reset. So how, how I set everything up was I locked the clock speed to 5.8 on the P cores. I have my little booklet with me. So I locked my Yeah, it was it was I think 5.8 on the P cores and 4.3 or 4.5 I don't remember sorry, but one of these two on the E cores. From there, I unlocked everything, you know, 4000 watts max, and I disabled all of these speed steps and, and whatnot, which could influence the amount of, uh, of uh, power used during a longer run. It, everything seemed to work perfectly fine, and once the system was up and running, I was able to use Intel XTU, XTU, I, 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 I need to look up how, how the thing is called. X, uh, XTU, Intel Extreme Tuning Utility, okay. I was able to use Intel XTU and artificially limit P1 and P2, so the max like power draws, down to 130, 225 and 340. And of course it, uh, it reduced the clock speed when I reduced it from 340 to 225 and to 130. I think with 130 watts it was dropping to like 3.8 gigahertz or 3.5 gigahertz on the peak cost. It was ridiculously slow, but it worked. And what I was really glad about is that the voltage, the, the V-core, stayed really, really consistent uh, with every cooler that I used. So every time I set it to what I call TRP3, which was 130 watts for PL1 and PL2, uh, the V-Core was sitting at 1.065. Every damn time, every cooler. And if I set it to 225, it was at 1.26. And if I set it to, one, uh, to 340 watts, which was for me P1, so 340 watts workload, we were limited to 1.53 V-Core. Now for P1 or 340 watts, what also happened is if the cooler did not handle that, it would just clock down and we ended up at 1.4, 1.3 V-Core, which then for me meant thermal, thermal throttling of the cooler because it cannot 
uh, maintain that workload and at the same time the CPU was already hitting 115 degrees C at that point so the cooler was out of the spectrum anyway. Now everything seemed fine, it was so easy to use this, it was so quick I could pop a cooler on there, benchmark P1 or P, in, in, my, in my notes P3 first, 130 watts first, then 225, then 340, rip the cooler off, put the next cooler on, uh, 130, 225, 340, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so I did for the last week. I, I benchmarked every liquid freezer in the beginning, every liquid freezer in combination with the ARGB subversion. So, uh, except for the 120, because it was discontinued as far as I um, remember. First the 420, then 360, then 280, then 240, and then every everyone twice, so eight AIOs in, in a very short period. It was about about three days that I, I needed for everything. Now a few things that I learned in, um, in that uh, one week. First off, the brackets that Arctic includes to mount down the water block pump combo to the... how should I call it? To like the frame and everything. Uh, to, to those double-ended screws that, that they uh, use with the backplate. If you have used an Arctic liquid freezer often enough over multiple years, the holes in these brackets will start to become bigger, let's say. So what happened is that two of my Arctic liquid freezers actually used LGA 12 and 1150 brackets, but they perfectly fit into an LGA 1700 uh, like mounting because the holes were bigger than they actually were supposed to be. However, even if they did fit in there, the temperature was ridiculously bad. The problem was that I switched from 420 to 360 and I'm, and I'm, I'm always just um, writing down the, the temperature above ambient and it dropped Oh, it risen like 10 degrees C from a uh, 420 to a 360. So it was a, a rise, yeah. And because I didn't have a lot of like reflective values that I could compare them to, I thought, okay, that, that, that's just the result. However, once I popped on the 280, I was like, yeah, no, the 280 is much, much better. Something is wrong here. And that's where I found out that the brackets were actually not LGA 1700 brackets, but LGA 1200 brackets which were just used far too often. So yeah, if you are in that position and you have an Arctic Liquid Freezer running for years, you can use LGA or you can force LGA 1200 brackets onto an LGA 1700 mounting, but it won't perform like it is supposed to. It, it seems like may, maybe it's a millimeter of space that is or a millimeter of, of bracket thickness that has changed in the meantime. Maybe it's, it's something else, but it won't perform exactly the same. That wasn't like my biggest concern. The, the big concern came when I benchmarked the Liquid Freezer 240. So I started with the 420, then it was uh, 360, 280, and then the last one was 240, but everyone twice. Before that, a few things on the numbers. Both on the very high end and the very low end, the numbers were squished ridiculously. For example, for the 130 watts workload, we had for the Liquid Freezer 360, we had 37.4 degrees C above ambient, which is a value. It makes sense. For the 280, we, ha we had 37 degrees C above ambient, so 0.2 degrees C less, which is okay. I mean, the difference between a 280 and a 360 will be ridiculously small if the workload is small enough. Take as a comparison our previous benchmark machine, which was also 135 watts, so 5 watts more, and there are the differences everything above like a Nokia NHD 15 became so squished and so weird because there was just not enough heat to make a difference between a good cooler and a bit better cooler. So I accepted that. For the mid-tier workloads, it made a lot of sense. For example, the 360 had 63.8 degrees C above ambient and the 280, oh no, let's first go to 420, this one had 60.5, so so that's 3.3 degrees C above ambient, less going from 360 to 480, which also made a lot of sense. That did make a lot of sense. However, then came something weird. 
And that was the 280, which had 65.1 degrees C. So the 280 was quite significantly behind the 360. And I didn't think so much about it because I knew that triple fan, so 360 should be better than the 280 at some point, but I didn't expect that to be such a big difference. The next indication that something was going on wrong was when I tried the 340 watts workload. There everything became squished again. And I'm talking really weird stuff like 86.3 above ambient for the Liquid Freezer 360. Then we had 84.7 for the 280 ARGB, so a bit better. And the 420, which is now the important one, had 84.2, which is just this better than anything else. Now the 420 ARGB had 84.9, which is even closer to the 280, no, it's 0.2 degrees C behind the 280 ARGB. So that didn't make sense, not at all. However, because we are now in the realm of huge workloads, huge amounts of watts of heat pumped out by that, by that little, little CPU, I wrote it off as the water block cannot, or the pump, cannot transport the heat away. So what I thought I was looking at, or maybe looking at, was a limitation because of the cold plate. I wasn't sure about that, but I would not find out until I pop another cooler on there, which is definitely not an Arctic liquid freezer. Like my plan was to take the Noxia NHT15 right after that, or after I finished the liquid freezer line, and then see how this one performs. And I was suspecting that this is a, water, a cold plate limitation, but I really wasn't sure about it. But I accepted it and I continued testing. Then the last liquid freezer that I, that I popped off was the smallest, the 240. And there shit really started to hit the fan. We had, for example, 36.8 degrees C on a 130 watts workload, which is a degree behind the, two, the 420, but significantly better than a 360. It was weird. I get that the numbers are squished, but that a 240 outperforms a 360, that, that's, nah, that's something wrong. But I could have been wrong because of the low workload. So I popped it up to 225 watts. And there we had, for the Liquid Freezer 240, 61.1 degrees C above ambient which is slightly behind a 420, but significantly in front of a 360 and a 280, which, yeah, there I was done. There I knew something is off. This is not cold plate limitation. This is not the pump is bad. This is not, we don't have enough heat. This is just wrong. Something happened here. It wasn't obvious at first. It, it really wasn't because the V-Core was consistent and and everything seemed, the package power, the, the readouts were all, you know, 225 watts, of course, going up and down a watt or half a watt, but everything seemed to be consistent. So what was going on? And after research and research and research, if you limit the, the raw deck, the PL1 and PL2, every time you ramp it up, something will change, like there are curves that the CPU applies to these kinds of things. And for example, even, even if the, the voltage will stay very consistent, and I'm, I'm, I really mean it, really, really consistent, the core clock will be limited in a different manner. So it will uh, jump up and down very, very differently every time you do that. And it will try to regulate based on something that I don't know, I, or I cannot control what it will be regulated by, but it will do it every time in a different manner. So at that point, I uh, retested, for example, the 420, which gave me, uh, I, I remember that, we had 60.5 degrees C above ambient the first time on 225 watts, and the second time we had 60.8. So we had 0.3 degrees C more, uh, above ambient, which is very, very good. That that's that's a clear indicator that that it work, that the benchmark machine works well. However, this was a coin flip every time I turned on the machine because the next time it was 65 point something, 
the, the time after that it was 60.0. So it was every time I started the benchmark, it was a coin flip. If the, the cooler will perform exactly the same, although my hardware monitor, hardware info, will display the same vCore, the same uh, package power, and what looks like to my eye like the same will create a very different type of, of heat load going into the cooler than the, the try before that. Yeah, I tested coolers for a whole week before finding that out, which is, which was devastating to say the least. And the reason why I'm making this video just to share my thoughts about this or, or share my findings that you cannot limit the, the TDP with PL1 and PL2 and expect it to perform exactly the same every time you start up the machine. Apparently, it just doesn't work. Something is fluctuating differently every goddamn time and it will create a very different heat load. Like, I, I was seeing differences up to 5 degrees C. Like, from testing, shutting off the machine, retesting, or just, you know, full blast CPU and then 100% uh, fan speed on everything. And I'm, I'm talking 5 minutes. And the, the heat rose like 5 degrees C or dropped 5 degrees C, which is very unusual. So if you, you do PL1, PL2 uh, limitation to test coolers, you will get different results every goddamn time. All of this happened like last Friday, which thankfully there was a weekend in between. So I was able to calm down a bit and I restarted the whole testing procedure. I need to retest everything. I basically lost a week. But yeah, that's just something that I've learned in the last week. You cannot limit PL1 and PL2 and lock the clock speed and, and thus also allow the clock speed to be reduced due to not enough power and expect the CPU to push the exact same amount of heat to the cooler every damn time. That doesn't work. It's very unfortunate because now in the end I need to have three profiles on the, on the BIOS and I need to reset the whole thing, load the other profile, power the whole thing up uh, when I switch from, for me, P1 to P2 to P3 on the same cooler. That, it always adds two or one or two minutes to every benchmark and in total it adds like five minutes to every cooler, which after you benchmark a hundred coolers, that's a bit of time. Very unfortunate, but it's the only way that I can guarantee that it's going to be exactly the same every goddamn time. So if anybody is in the position uh, where he needs to have this information, there you have it. But it's also quite interesting for me, like uh, if you do a build, because everybody, and, and me including, is saying if you get, for example, a 3900K, just limit the TDP, because it doesn't make any sense to leave it like unchecked, because there will be so much heat generated for literally zero performance uplift. However, uh, based on my findings now, uh, it also means that the heat output will differ every goddamn time. If you limit, for example, your 3900K to 340 watts, you may end up having a 5 degrees C fluctuation every time you start your PC, which is weird, but it's, it's interesting. I, I don't think I will dive any deeper into this issue because I'm so pissed about the last week, but it's, it's an interesting topic. But okay, for the three people out there who needed this information, <laughs> there you have it. And my experience with, or my first experience with a benchmarking machine. I hope this week's, I really hope this week will be better than last week. But okay, if you want to continue watching, have a look at our uh, Octopus series, which uh, has been completed by now, but I don't think everything is released by now, but uh, have a look at them. Thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.